Last time around, we went through the long, complicated history of the Yokai Watch franchise, both in its home country of Japan and abroad. Developer and publisher Level 5 and their president and CEO, Akihiro Hino, hoped to make a splash all around the world, driving the multimedia powerhouse toward international success. If you live in America, however, you might have noticed that, well, Yokai Watch hasn't really stuck around. If you were paying attention in 2015 when the series saw its first round of media blitz, with games, anime, manga, and toys all hitting the market almost simultaneously, you might be even more confused. That year, Yokai Watch really seemed like it promised to be the Pokemon killer, that term the media was so quick to either jump on or avoid like the plague. And yet, within a few short years, like a wisp in the night, the anime disappeared, the manga became relegated to consistent publication uh, without fanfare, and the games began to lag years behind their Japanese releases. Though admittedly they still hit, even if in frustratingly small quantities. That being said, whether you were paying attention five years back or not, you might find yourself, like us, asking, what happened to Yokai Watch? To understand how Yokai Watch performed stateside, we need to first discuss how the series fared in Japan. And to understand the phenomenon in Japan, there are two things we need to keep in mind. No matter how popular and successful Yokai Watch may have become in the Land of the Rising Sun, it wasn't initially that big of a deal, and perhaps more importantly, Hino has gone on record to say that he was taken aback by how quickly the franchise garnered an audience. Hino stated, quote, We've learned a lot from Inazuma 11 and LBX, and used those lessons when making Yokai Watch, so I was confident that we'd see at least some success. I didn't think it had become quite this big a hit, but it makes me very happy that it's been such a success. Not just for Level 5, but for all of our other partners producing content alongside us." End quote. When the first game was released in July 2013, the manga had been running for half a year. The television series, however, was still six months away from premiering on TV Tokyo. While the first game had performed well enough upon its debut, it experienced a massive spike a few months before the sequel was set to release in Japan. This has been attributed largely to the series garnering a new audience through the anime's broadcast, commencing six months prior to the sequel's release. Nadia Oxford, writing for US Gamer in 2016, explained that kids who weren't necessarily into gaming became passive observers of Yokai Watch thanks to its easy availability through television, which then spiraled into a snowball of success for the games and toys. As a side note, the sales pace for the first game was even faster in Europe several years later. But, just like in America, the game didn't have the longevity it did in Japan. This newfound interest in Yokai Watch lasted the better part of 2014, with one of the heaviest knockoff effects being the massive demand for branded toys, namely watches and medals. Reports from the time detail that these were notoriously difficult to acquire because enough stock had simply not been manufactured to meet the new wave of demand. However, while this scarcity may have proved beneficial to the property in the short term, it may have also spelled its doom in a long-term sense. The first set of watches were rare, prompting heavy interest in them to the point of massive lines at toy stores and day one sellouts of stock when new stock arrived. Price scalpers made a killing at the time, reselling watches for double their list price while some retailers resorted to raffles for the opportunity to buy goods. This scarcity was finally remedied by increased production, but two issues arose. First, Bandai overshot and produced too many toys, leading to an overabundance of stock getting dumped into clearance bins in no time. Second, the first and second sets of watches and medals were incompatible, meaning that if one purchased the early medals but a second wave watch, they couldn't be used together. Hino explained when asked about the franchise's cross-media approach to marketing, quote, The key for a long-lasting hit piece of entertainment is whether the business side, like merchandise, games, and movies, is successful. That's why you develop commercial goods necessary for cutting-edge entertainment and include the latest features in your games." End quote. The slow rollout in Japan seemed to do the job in this regard, but unfortunately it didn't last forever, and it didn't seem to work in the first place overseas. But we'll get there. Returning to Japan as the years began to pass, 
Yokai Watch's star quickly began to fall. The series was initially so popular that beginning in 2015, more than 10 stores themed around the franchise were set up in June. In 2019, it was reported that the last of these shops was preparing to close. The second film, released in December 2015, proved so popular that it outperformed Star Wars The Force Awakens at the box office. The most recent movie, released December 2019, made just over six million upon release, a far cry from the previous box office numbers which have continually declined each year. These are just a few examples of how the franchise was in steady decline between 2014 and the present. Jcast reports that in 2014, the franchise hit its record high 55.2 billion yen. In 2015, this fell to 32.9 billion yen. And by 2016, the revenue had sunk to a measly 10.4 billion yen. Bear in mind that there was a new game each year between 2014 and 2016, meaning that the third numbered title, arguably the most ambitious at that point, was released in 2016. This was not a good sign. Hino directly expressed disappointment in Nikkei Trendy at the failure of Yokai Watch 3, especially given the massive showing the second game received in Japan, remaining the best selling version of the franchise to date. A franchise making almost $100 million in a year is not small potatoes, don't get us wrong. But compare this with a powerhouse like Pokemon making more than $2 billion in 2015, and compare Yokai Watch's revenue in 2016 with the meteoric start in 2014, and you might begin to understand why this decline was so sharp that Hino announced he wanted to put the series on pause in 2016 to focus on other projects. This decline in Japan could be attributed to several different factors. There's the potential that Yokai Watch lacked any staying power, especially in terms of mascots. There could be Level 5's unwillingness to stick with a specific image and course for the entire franchise, and their insistence on flipping the script three times in as many years. It could be the aforementioned issues with toy availability damaging the brand, or else creating so much stock that the franchise's value tanked. It could also be the level of bureaucracy involved in Level 5's business model for cross-platform promotion. Let's take this one step at a time. First, the mascots. In the universe of Yokai Watch, the human characters are important, but act more as vehicles for getting us into the Yokai world than anything. In truth, the real stars are the Yokai. The face and original mascot of Yokai Watch, Jibanyan, was inspired by Akihiro Hino's experience with a stray cat. As he explained, quote, I passed it by at first, thinking that I probably couldn't keep a cat at home, but it was just so cute, I thought to myself, I gotta do this. So I came back a few minutes later, but by that time, it had already been hit by a car. End quote. Jibanyan, a Nekamata, and his fellow early series mascot, Komasan, based upon a Koma Inu, were introduced from the beginning, but were intended to be replaced over time by other cute characters. Hino stated, quote, I'm working on bringing out a third yokai that is different from those two. It's like with a variety show. You don't continue with the same members all the time, but switch them out every now and then to change the atmosphere. That's what makes a show last longer. I believe that Yokai Watch needs such a device." End quote. From the beginning, we had Jibanyan, Whisper, Komasan, and Komasan's brother, Komajiro. By the time the third game came around, we were introduced to Usapion, an otter in a spacesuit who befriends the alien-obsessed second protagonist, Inaho, known in English as Haley Ann. Another two years later, the anime series came to an end and was replaced by Shadowside. Sure, Shadowside introduced a new, muscle-bound take on Slim Amander, who could be argued to be a sidekick mascot, but in truth, Jibanyan, Komasan, and Whisper steal the limelight again. Except that Shadowside only helped to exacerbate the identity crisis Yokai Watch was suffering, rather than fixing things up. More or less, the series had promised several waves of mascots, only to cut this short and replace a potential third wave with an updated version of the first wave. This progression is expressed in the data collected through Bandai's annual survey concerning popular children's properties. In 2015, their poll found that Yokai Watch ranked most popular among Japanese children's characters. 
By 2017, this survey showed Yokai Watch had fallen to number three in the ranking. And by 2018, Yokai Watch didn't even place in the top 10 for this survey. The franchise hadn't simply stuck with Jibanyan alone, instead giving a number of other cats and dogs and one lucky otter the limelight. In 2018, however, this reverted to Jibanyan, though not in his original form. The series was left somewhat rudderless, as Shadowside effectively made the yokai too mature for small children, but not mature enough for the intended teenage audience. This made it so that their target demographic was ambiguous. As early as 2015, Hino commented, quote, Moving forward, we want to keep doing that. Talking about the next generation of our audience, we want to make sure we continue to offer new features that appeal to that next generation. We want to treat these characters in Yokai Watch like the stars on a variety show. On a variety show, there are trends. Every season's different. Anime TV shows have different seasons where the second one will be out, the third one will be in development, and the fourth and fifth one will be worked up later on. We want to make sure that every time we come up with something new, it will appeal to a new generation of users and match with what they want." End quote. This vision seems to have been half committed to, with Level 5 waffling on what they wanted for the franchise. Perhaps the most direct example of this is the decision to temporarily resurrect the show's original characters, art style, and tone in 2019, only to dump it once more after less than a year. This identity crisis didn't begin in 2018 and 19 with Shadowside and the new version of Yokai Watch, however. In terms of the gaming side of things, this inability to stay the course extended a few years even before this. As video game sales dipped in Japan and kids got older, a collection of Yokai Watch smartphone games were introduced to the market. These were arguably brought on board in an attempt to reinvigorate interest in the series amongst kids, according to Jcast. Earlier, Hino more or less spoke out against producing mobile games except as a bonus. He explained, quote, I'm aware that the mobile market is getting bigger, but I feel like the major platform that kids still play games with is the Nintendo 3DS. I want to offer the best quality game on the system that kids still play with. That's why we're offering Yokai Watch on the 3DS. But the foundation is the best quality game that kids can play on a game platform. At the same time, we made sure to include features and functionality that adults can enjoy as well. When you combine those two elements, Yokai Watch is something that not just kids, but the whole family can enjoy together." End quote. The change of heart here likely arose from the financial struggle of the mainline games, a fortune which doesn't seem to be changing anytime soon. Unfortunately, even after a three-year gap without a mainline game, Yokai Watch 4 performed exceptionally poorly, selling only about 200,000 copies for the Nintendo Switch and only about 3,000 copies on PlayStation 4 during its release month. Brian Ashcroft, the writer we mentioned earlier, argues that the gameplay experience of Yokai Watch is shallower than Pokemon. While we definitely don't agree with this, especially given how the series switched up its battle system in terms of complexity with its third entry, we ought to consider his opinion here. Ashcroft argues that while Yokai is easily played by kids, it doesn't retain their interest as they grow up, due largely to how simple it is. In this worldview, perhaps the mobile games were brought on as a stopgap between main entries which were beginning to flag in terms of popularity, though admittedly not in terms of critical reception. But then again, critical numbers are not the same as sales numbers. Lastly, the dip in popularity in Japan circa 2015 could be thanks to the bureaucracy inherent in running the franchise through nearly half a dozen different companies. Forbes questioned if this massive production machine might have slowed production across the board, as well as leading to the incompatibility between different waves of toys. In this same article, the author argues that other Level 5 properties suffered the same fate simultaneously, questioning whether this was all because of an oversaturation of Level 5 properties in the marketplace. In 2016, meanwhile, Hino refuted this, claiming to observe no oversaturation. As he put it, quote, we do not believe that our titles have oversaturated marketing in Japan, and we don't attribute our success to only marketing initiatives." End quote. As we look at Yokai Watch's impact in Japan, it becomes apparent that there are a number of explanations for why the series had such a meteoric rise before a quick tumble downhill. Perhaps we'll never know exactly why the series struggled so greatly to recover in its home nation. 
We've laid out some of the more likely options here. When it comes to America, however, we get the feeling that we have a much more concrete sense of why Yokai Watch failed to even make the initial splash in Enjoyed in Japan. Plain and simple, the franchise suffered from severe mishandling, and became a quick victim of the bureaucratic mess that Forbes questioned over in Japan. Truthfully, we don't have any direct confirmation of this from any involved parties, but all signs point to the several companies in charge of the localization of Yokai Watch wishing to go in different directions with the property, and not necessarily communicating effectively about these goals. In Japan, four primary companies control the fate of Yokai Watch. Level 5 develops and distributes the games, OLM produces the various anime series, Koro Koro serializes the manga, and Bandai produces and sells the toys to retailers. In America, on the other hand, the games were published by Nintendo, the manga was translated by Viz, the anime was broadcast by Disney, and the toys were manufactured by Hasbro. Unfortunately, it doesn't appear that those working on the American side of the franchise communicated much, or else they seemed to break communication over time, as different aspects of the franchise were handled in wildly different manners. Let's take a look at it one step at a time. First, Hasbro was placed in charge of manufacturing and selling Yokai watch related toys in the United States, including watches and medals. While nothing as botched as the Japanese mismatch between their first and second wave of medals occurred, there were certainly some questionable elements to Hasbro's strategy. As Hino explained in 2015, quote, Sharing the experience across media is a big thing for us. We wanted to make sure that we could have a solid plan for that in the overseas markets. In the US, Hasbro is bringing out the toys, and we want to build the same kind of phenomenon we had in Japan. The plan is solid, and I'm very comfortable with what we're currently bringing over. End quote. Unfortunately, certain products were either never released in America, or were replaced wholesale by products deemed inferior by fans. For example, the Yokai Pad, which proved popular, if a bit gimmicky, in Japan and Korea, was not localized by Hasbro. Instead, Level 5 had their American division cook up an augmented reality app for smartphones to bridge the gap left without a metal reader for American kids. In the other example we're referring to, Hasbro made the decision to create a card game which they dubbed the Yokai Watch Trading Card Game. This is strange when we consider that Japan and other territories already had a successful, popular card game known as In Spirit Card Battle, which had already been translated into English for certain Asian markets. John Reinfurt, the illustrator for the American card game, explained to the website Mount Wildwood that he took influence from In Spirit Card Battle for his work, while the company ignored that game itself, as he explained, quote, Absolutely. The idea was to give the US version a distinct new look, but it was very important that it still stayed true to the pre-existing Yokai Watch universe that the fans all love. End quote. Hino was quoted as wanting the medals to take off in America as they had in Japan. According to him, quote, It creates communication between kids, trading the medals. Some of the rare medals are traded for $500. The face value is like $1. But some of the rare ones have become valued a lot by the kids. So I hope kids in America will be excited about the yokai medals as well." End quote. Unfortunately for Hino, Pokemon cards, these were not. We were able to find several vloggers on YouTube reporting that the remaining yokai watch stock of medals, figures, and plushes were apparently being dumped into dollar stores across America, creating a brief window where no one wanted them and anyone could snag them for a fraction of their face value. By 2018, it was reported that Hasbro had either lost, willingly given up, or defaulted on the toy license for the franchise. That same year, McDonald's ran a Happy Meal campaign for the series, though McDonald's manufactures their own toys, meaning that this is unrelated to Hasbro. Otherwise, as of now, Yokai Watch toys seem more or less dead in America. Nintendo, meanwhile, had high hopes for the franchise. They were willing to sink a good chunk of cash into marketing to get the franchise off the ground in the states, and they may have gotten burned in the process. Prior to localization, Nintendo's press release about the first game touted Japanese sales of all merchandise at $2 billion as of August 2015. On April 7th of that year, the company announced that they would bring the first game to America. 
Vice argued that concurrent with the launch of the first game, a growing market share existed for mobile games over handheld gaming. They also pointed to the number of 3DSs in Japan relative to population as an explanation of why the games could be so successful there, but may not be here. These might not have been the only issues Yokai Watch was facing in America either. The first version of Yokai Watch did well enough in America for Nintendo to go all in and release all three versions of its sequel. As Hino explained, quote, This trend is following what happened in Japan. In Japan, the numbers weren't really historic with the original game. But then it became a big, big social phenomenon with Yokai Watch 2. So that's what we're anticipating to happen in the US. End quote. Two versions of Yokai Watch 2 were published in late 2016, with the third version arriving about a year later in 2017. Unfortunately for Nintendo, the very games which competed with and may have diminished the Yokai Watch market share in 2016 were their own doing. Pokemon nostalgia hit a long time high among Americans in 2016 with not only the release of Pokemon Go, but a set of new mainline games, Sun and Moon. These dropped less than two months after the release of Yokai Watch 2 in America. And while journalists like Chad Sapieha, writing for the Financial Post, argued that Yokai Watch 2 was more strange and less predictable, and although they urged readers to try it out, the numbers would seem to indicate that most Americans in the market for Monster Collection in 2016 knew where their money was headed. Yokai Watch 2 didn't exactly do gangbusters in America, with copies so common that nowadays you can grab either of the initial two for fairly cheap. Yokai Watch 2 remains the best-selling iteration of the franchise in Japan, with more than 3 million copies, while in America only about 200,000 units were moved. The same held true for other later titles like Blasters, which boasted more than 2 million sales in Japan, but fewer than 100,000 in America. Nintendo proceeded to publish further titles in America, including the Blasters spin-offs and Yokai Watch 3, though these seem almost like boutique releases given their small print quantities. It's been confirmed that Yokai Watch 4 should see an American release, though there's no confirmation as of yet whether Nintendo will solely publish the game on Switch, or if another company will also pick up the PlayStation 4 version of the game. Additionally, this news came in 2019, and admittedly, given how 2020 has turned out, there have been no new updates. Of course, the overall lack of success with the video games in America and later titles in Japan could be linked to the flagging support for Level 5's console of choice, the 3DS. Believe it or not, the 3DS family did poorly for Nintendo in general. 75.71 million units sold might sound like a lot, but not when you stack it up against any of their other handhelds. That's right, the 3DS was Nintendo's worst-selling handheld globally. More handhelds were sold in America compared with Japan, though this is likely due to population sizes being so far apart in both territories. Either way, it's important to note that Yokai Watch may have been hurting from the get-go due to the 3DS's legacy, though the jump to the Switch with Yokai Watch 4 may indicate that something is pushing folks away from the brand other than its home console. Jumping back to the release of Yokai Watch 2, 2016 was supposed to be Yokai Watch's big year in America. It may have made its official debut the year before, but this was when the franchise started firing on all cylinders over here. Think of it as a parallel to what happened in Japan, where the original game came out, and then there was a media blitz about six months to a year later. Not only did the second game arrive in America in 2016, but the series made inroads into the mobile market with the debut of Wibble Wobble. The first season of the anime was published on Netflix in an attempt to garner a larger audience, and the first film was given a special screening in America through Fathom Events. All throughout, Viz Media kept localizing the manga, something they've continued with until today. We don't really think Viz deserves much of the blame for how Yokai Watch was handled, in truth. Given how niche of a market manga is in this country compared with the video games, toys, and children's television. Strangely, a three-issue comic was published by IDW in 2017, which is, let's just say, it's best we leave that one alone for the most part. Check out the article linked below concerning this one to find out why if you're dying to learn more. While Nintendo handled their lot with grace and continues to stick with the franchise, Disney does not seem to have carried on in the same manner. In total, the company localized and broadcast fewer than 100 of the original show's 214 episodes. From the beginning, the show was troubled, given its positioning on Disney XD. 
even in its first week when five episodes were broadcast consecutively, and even accounting for online publication of early episodes, Disney's version of Yokai Watch never managed to crack more than half a million viewers. Reportedly, with the three seasons that Disney helped to produce for American audiences, they were broadcast intermittently, making it difficult for viewers to keep track of the show. During the several troubled years of its run on Disney XD, the station also picked up fellow Level 5 property Inazuma 11, and even new episodes of Pokemon, both of which might have edged this show out of the market. During the third season, Disney even recast most of the voices suddenly, switching from their use of Bang Zoom Entertainment for the dub to SDI Media. This was, allegedly, done to help with budgetary concerns on a show that wasn't really making returns, though this has never been directly or publicly confirmed by Disney. Some fans of the show point to this recasting as the point where the show truly died, causing unneeded backlash against the anime from an already small and strained base. In other words, this may have been the final nail in the coffin for a potential fourth season. Earlier in 2020, the show supposedly showed back up in rotation on Disney XD, with fans speculating whether this meant that Disney was potentially testing interest in a fourth season, or whether they were just filling time with a show to which they still hold the rights. Hino seems reticent to point the finger at any American company for mishandling his baby in the US. At one point, Hino stated, quote, it was surprising to me, but when we did the research, people's reactions to the more Japanese-looking yokai were better than we expected. I felt that kids, in particular, have an admiration for oriental-style things." End quote. That is a quote. We did not put that word in there. That was Akihiro Hino himself. Paradoxically, he explained in 2015, quote, there are some elements that only work with Japanese culture, and some elements that we had to tweak a little bit to fit the humor for an overseas audience. But we kept the essence of Yokai Watch as it is to bring it here." End quote. Only a short time later, Hino echoed this point about a clash of cultures, saying that there are two types of places in the world, those receptive to Japanese brands and those who are not. He went on to classify America as the latter, saying, quote, I think those are areas where we have to sell our product as more of a fantasy story, rather than a Japanese story." End quote. In his mind, something like Pokemon could remain successful because of its basis in a made-up reality, while Yokai Watch couldn't succeed thanks to being set in Japan and localized for America, where the location names were changed to indicate that the series takes place in America, but where it clearly doesn't. Sadly, Hino was somewhat prophetic with another one of his statements about bringing the franchise stateside. He explained, quote, Even though there's lots of great content in Japan as well, kids are always looking for new content that matches up with their generation, and Yokai Watch slotted in perfectly with that. I think that our ability to connect to kids in modern day America will greatly affect the fate of this franchise. End quote. This idea seems to have held true as the decline of Yokai Watch in America coincided with its similar decline in Japan. Say what we might, there are still several reasons Yokai Watch may have underperformed both at home and abroad. It could have been mishandling on the part of multiple companies. It could have been growth which outpaced its potential or its audience's patience. It could have been the producers overestimating interest in the property. Whatever the case, we're sad to say that today Yokai Watch exists in a greatly reduced state compared with its prime. In a few short years, the franchise went from being a leading entertainment powerhouse in Japan and a promising upstart globally to a largely ignored staple in its home country and an oddity at best elsewhere. If nothing else, we can say that we went into this franchise with relatively low expectations we experienced some pretty low lows. But we also experienced some adorable, captivating, brain-teasing, and genuinely fun highs. Yokai Watch isn't for everyone. But if you've ever entertained a passing interest in the franchise, we hope we've shown that there's a wealth of media and resources to dive into. So go check out the anime, pick up one of the games on discount, give the manga a try, or go yokai hunting in bargain bins and flea markets. On second thought, maybe wait a few years before you do that last one. But no matter how, give the franchise a look. 
We certainly uncovered heaps more than we ever would have anticipated when we started this journey almost two years ago. And even now, we know we're far from finished plumbing the depths and discovering all there is to know about Yokai Watch. Special thanks today to YouTuber Abdallah Smash, who allowed the use of tons and tons of his gameplay footage throughout these videos. Honestly, there are so many games cataloged on his channel from this franchise that either aren't available in the West, are not easily available, or simply aren't available anymore at all because they've been deleted off the App Store. Go check out his channel, give him a sub, and let him know that we sent you.